As the capital of the European Union, Brussels is not only the capital of Belgium, but that of Europe as well. The city can be divided into two sections, the lower town that also includes the medieval city center and the uptown where the royal palace and the high society district are located. The Grand Place is the heart of the city. Merchants have been offering their wares here under tents put up outdoors since as early as the 11th century. By the 14th century, the Odelle de Ville, or the town hall, was built. Industrial and merchant guilds wanted to be as close as possible to the powers that be, so they surrounded the square with their guild halls. Thus took form the unified look of the Grand Place, which remained unchanged even after the French bombardment turned the city into a heap of rubble. The square was rebuilt in a style approved by the city council, hence the harmonious and integrated Flemish Renaissance look was created. Brussels has long been one of the major commercial centers of Europe, so the aldermen wanted to raise a public administration building worthy of such status. The building was designed by Jacques van Tienen and Jan van Ruysbroek. The impressive bell tower, on top of which the weather vane has been replaced by a statue of St. Michael, is 96 meters high. The facade is adorned by a total of 137 artistically elaborated sculptures. Northwest of the town hall stands the group of buildings that is the home to the houses of the three richest guilds, Le Renard was commissioned by the haberdashers, Le Cornet by the boatmen, and Le Roi d'Espagne by the bakers. The Renard is decorated fittingly with cherubs playing with ribbons, while the Cornet is bedecked by the figurehead of a frigat. There's a golden dancing figure on the cupola of the Le Roi d'Espagne, and its first floor is home to the best café in the square, the perfect place to watch passing pedestrians from under the umbrellas. Across from Town Hall, there is a small towered building that, with its shorter tower, perfectly reflects the larger without diminishing its grandeur. It's the Maison du Roi. In the course of centuries, the once lively palace of Spanish royalty petrified into a museum. An interesting feature of the exhibition displaying the history of Brussels is the collection of 400 little outfits made for the mannequin piece, the famous Brussels fountain sculpture of a naked little boy urinating into the fountain's basin. On both sides of the Maison du Roi, separated by an alley on each side, rises the little palace called the Northwest Corner and the Le Pigeon. Both used to be guild halls once. The latter provided shelter to Victor Hugo while he was in exile. The great French author loved to live here. He left France after the coup d'etat orchestrated by Louis Bonaparte, and following a brief tour to Jersey Island, he returned after the fall of Napoleon III. The La Maison des Ducs de Brabant was named after the statues of the Duke's family. The massive building straddling the southeastern side of the square gave home to the houses of six guilds. Guillaume de Brun designed the building that mixes Flemish features with neoclassical elements of architecture. The early morning flower market turns the cobblestone square into a lively, colorful garden. Every two years, in August, at the time of the Plantation de Maibaume, the entire 1,800 square meter area of the place is covered by a fascinating carpet of flowers. The compositions made of millions of fresh flowers usually depict historic scenes. Everard Cercles, the leader of the rebelling craftsmen, drove the Flemish out of Brussels in 1356, but he fell in the battle. His bronze statue is said to bring you luck if you touch it on the arm. You can imagine how highly touch-polished the arm of the statue has become by now, considering that Brussels has seven million visitors a year. The small, barely 30 centimeter tall statue of a boy relieving himself into a basin has become the symbol of Brussels. According to legend, the son of a duke did the same during a battle and that is the scene supposedly depicted by the bronze sculpture created by Jérôme Ducasnoy. Visiting heads of state usually donate a miniature version of their country's national dress as a present for the statue and the exhibit of these costumes is on display at the Maison du Roi. Nearby, in Rue de Boucher, there's a female counterpart of Monacan Piss called Janica Piss, put up in 1987. The Rue de Boucher is called the Stomach of Brussels. You can find a restaurant, an eatery, or a bar in almost every house. And you can buy buttered, steamed mussels at every corner. Seafood is very popular around here. Fresh herring, lobsters, and oysters are brought in from Ostenda to be served at the table of the capital's restaurants. 
the meat dishes of Belgian cuisine are represented by veal sweetbreads, black pudding, beer marinated steak, and rabbit stew. The desserts, cakes, and cheese reflect the French influence. Belgian pralines are world famous. The country obtained huge cocoa plantations upon the colonization of Congo. Their dark chocolates are 80 to 90 percent cocoa and are extremely delicious, flavored with coffee or orange. Milk chocolates are made using traditionally high quality Flemish milk, while Belgian white chocolate has a very high cocoa butter content. For these three kinds of chocolate, a very wide variety of flavors, spices, and creams is used, made using highly guarded secret family recipes. Most phases of chocolate manufacturing are still done by hand. That's the guarantee of high quality and the explanation for the high price. These exquisite pralines are perfect presents to bring home the flavor of Belgium for friends and family. Brussels is a very good place to shop for luxury items as gifts for your loved ones. In addition to chocolate shops, many tiny stores offer their goods along the shopping streets. Elegant boutiques, gift shops, department stores, and shopping malls invite you to spend your money there. The glass-roofed shopping arcade, Galerie Saint-Hubert, is one of the oldest such facilities in Europe and one of the most elegant as well. It was opened by King Leopold I in 1847. The Neo-Renaissance building of Jean-Pierre Clausenard became a favorite meeting place among the high society shortly after its opening. Where else were two fine French gentlemen to meet? Victor Hugo and Dumas were frequent visitors of the cafés and the theater of the Saint-Hubert. The lace of Brussels has been famous for centuries. Back in the Renaissance era, King Charles V issued a decree in which he made lace making a mandatory subject at girls' schools and convents. While other countries switched to mass production, to this day, Belgian lace is still handmade by lace makers who often juggle a hundred threads simultaneously. You can usually find specialized lace shops in the elegant shopping streets of the capital, but the Lace Museum is located in Bruges. The restaurants in Brussels range from small, cheap pubs offering local specialties to trendy, posh luxury restaurants. There are many seafood places, and due to the multinational culture of the city, many restaurants of international cuisine can be found as well. Since Belgians love to dine out, Brussels offers an extremely wide selection of restaurants, so rest assured. Finding a place to your liking will definitely not take you more than 10 minutes. However, at popular eateries, you should reserve a table in advance. A nice activity after dinner could be a concert of your choice. Opera, classical music, and dance lovers will find a venue to enjoy themselves just like the fans of jazz, pop, and rock music. Since Brussels is not far from Paris, London, and Amsterdam, all major musicians, bands, and dance ensembles make a stop here during their European tour. Due to the use of renewable energy, especially the wind blowing from the Atlantic Ocean, electricity is very cheap in Belgium. So the squares, streets, and buildings of Brussels are bathed in light every night. Today, the aristocratic upper town is not that different from the buzzing lower town as it used to be. In the Middle Ages, lower town was mostly populated by Flemish merchants, while the denizens of uptown were typically Wallon noblemen. The two parts of the city are divided by a diagonal boulevard running from north to south. The Royal District spreads out on Koudenberg Mountain, which is actually just a hill, where a long time ago the Dukes of Brabant used to go hunting. Along the outskirts of that hunting ground, palaces were built as early as the 15th century, and by the 1700s, the Parc de Bruxelles, lined by fountains and trees, was created. On the two narrower sides of the park, the Royal Palace and the building of the Parliament face each other. Upper Town is full of parks and green areas. The Place du Petit Chablon, for example, is a nice little French garden that is home to the fountain erected as a monument to Counts Egmont and Orn, who led the uprising against Spanish oppressors. Both of them were executed on the Grand Place. The side figures of the sculpture depict various artists and scientists, including the famous geographer and cartographer Gerhard Mercator. The Cathédrale Saint-Michel et Gudule is the National Church of Belgium, although it was declared a cathedral only in 1962. The building which this marvel of Brabantian Gothic architecture resembles most is the Notre Dame in Paris. Especially its domeless twin towers may look familiar, 
although this pair was originally designed to look like this, while those of Notre Dame were never finished due to lack of funds. As in the case of almost every church built in the Middle Ages, the location of the Saint-Michel was already a place of prayer before. The Romanesque remains were discovered during Reconstruction and are now on display in the crypt. King Henry I ordered the construction of the cathedral in 1226, and it was pronounced completed during the reign of King Charles V. The most notable museum of Brussels is the Royal Museum of Fine Arts, combining the old Museum of Arts and the modern Museum of Arts under one name. This huge, maze-like group of buildings was home to many glorious artworks from the 15th up to the 20th century. The humble collection of art left behind after the raid of the French troops was exhibited in the Palais de Charles de Lorraine. Later, the collection grew so large that it necessitated a new home. The present gallery was opened in 1887. Currently, it's home to the best collection of Flemish art in the world, including the paintings of Rubens, Bruegel, and many others. The eight floors of the new wing comprising the Musée d'Art Moderne are underground, but the inner court was designed to let in an ample amount of natural light. On the wall of a building in the nearby Rue de la Régence, there is a special carillon that features modern statues as figures, which makes the chime a singular attraction, even on an international scale. The Place Royale gives a stately, impressive sight with its tall, symmetrical, light-colored buildings. At the upper end stands the horse statue of Gottfried de Bouillon, a Brabantian crusader who fell during the First Crusade in Jerusalem. The most beautiful building of the square is the Église Saint-Jacques sur Caudenberg. A chapel for the Dukes of Caudenberg stood here from the 12th century. In the great fire that destroyed the palace, the chapel was also badly damaged. The current neoclassical building raised in its place was consecrated in 1787. The palace was never rebuilt. Its remains were taken down and its grand hall was opened up only during the excavations that took place in 1995. The interior of the church is simple and elegant. On either side, a huge painting of Jan Portels hangs, framing the royal bench in the middle. The Saint-Jacques sur Caudenberg was the temple of reason and law during the Great French Revolution and was returned to the Catholic Church only in 1802. The Palais Royal is the residence of Belgian royalty. Construction began in 1820 and it was hardly finished when the renovation of the old wing already started again. The palace is only open in the summer when the royal family is away vacationing. The flag on top of the building indicates whether the king is in town or not. The rooms most preferred by tour guides are the throne hall and the hall of mirrors. The bright light in the huge throne hall is provided by 11 gigantic crystal chandeliers. The hall of mirrors was designed after its counterpart in Versailles. This is the place where reception parties for foreign diplomats, heads of state and ambassadors are held. The ceiling of the long gallery is adorned by a special painting of dawn, daylight, and twilight, while in the small white hall, portraits of 19th century kings can be seen. Of course, the palace has its own garden, separated from the Parc de Bruxelles by the Place du Palais, a wide walkway. Tourists often hang around waiting for the changing of the guard that takes place in the courtyard of the palace. The entire northern section of the park is occupied by the Palace of the Nation, as the Parliament is called here. The building was designed by French architect Barnabé Guimard. It was finished in 1783, but exactly to the date 100 years later, it was almost completely destroyed in a fire. The renovated neoclassic palace is where the plenary sessions of the two chambers of the Belgian Parliament, the Chamber of Representatives and the Senate are held. The relief on the façade was created by Gilles Lambert Gauchard and is entitled The Reward of the Good and the Punishment of Evil.
the Ark of Triumph, and the Parc de Cinquantenaire were commissioned by the order of King Leopold II to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the independence of Belgium. Thus, the formerly unused marsh area of the city was put to use. Eventually, by the stipulated deadline, only the park and two exhibition halls were completed, where the 1880 Art and Industrial Fair was held. The originally planned Arc of Triumph was built 50 years later. The designs for the gates of the city were inspired by the Triomphe d'Arc in Paris, with a four-horse carriage and symbolic figures on top and the national crest below them. For a period of time, the huge halls stood there empty, but later they were used as a venue for horse races and occasional exhibitions. The area got a new surge of life towards the end of the 20th century. That was when the Art Nouveau Pavilion of architect Victor Orta was opened. The Great Halls became home to four museums. The Musée Royal d'Art et d'Histoire is mainly dedicated to artifacts of ancient civilizations, but it also has a section on industrial design. The Musée de la Mai is an exhibition of war history and includes an aircraft collection, the Musée Royal de la Mai et d'Histoire Militaire. The name of the fourth exhibition is Auto World, which is probably the best museum in the world on the subject. Two quarters of Brussels are occupied by the buildings of the European Union. The Quartier Européen is where the Council of Ministers and Public Officers work, while the Parliament Quarter is in the Quartier Leopold. The permanent seat of the European Parliament is in Strasbourg, while the administrative centre is located in Luxembourg, but the committee sessions are held in Brussels. The locals call the huge supermodern steel frame glass structure the Caprice de Deux, which means the whims of the gods. The name also refers to a French cheese packed in an oval container and to the haughtiness of the parliament as well. Many Brazilians are still angry because the charming Leopold section of the city was almost completely swept away to be replaced by the headquarters of the EU. The circle named after Robert Schumann, EU politician, is an important traffic hub. There's still a little bit of the air lingering of the former Leopold quarter here. The many small pubs in the area are mainly frequented by the officials of the Union, but are also favorites among tourists. For taking photographs, Park Leopold offers the best view of the Parliament building, but that's not the only reason it's worth visiting. The Museum of the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences is located in the park, and the area surrounding the Little Lake provides an island of calm in the buzz of the city. In Kuckelberg, in the outskirts of Brussels, King Leopold II planned to raise a huge temple dedicated to all the people who sacrificed their life for the country. The original designs of Pierre Langerock showed a neo-Gothic church back in 1904. But because the donations of churchgoers trickled in very slowly, significant changes were made to the plan. The modern building of Albert von Huffel was completed only in the 1970s. The Basilique Nationale de Sacré-Cœur is a truly 20th century structure. Its Art Deco style makes it very different from the other churches in Belgium. The clinker bricked walled basilica with the green copper cupola is a place of memorial services held from time to time to commemorate the victims of the two world wars. The internal yard with its squarely broken lines has a more interesting look than the reserved exterior of the building. The 90 meter high cupola offers an unparalleled view of the capital of Belgium. There are several sites located outside the ring surrounding the city center that should not be missed either. The 100-meter-high Atomium was originally built for the 1958 World Expo and soon became a symbol of the city. It consists of nine spheres of 18 meters in diameter each, connected by escalators running through the tubes. The creation of André Waterkane intends to symbolize the triumph of science with a replica of the atomic structure of iron magnified 165 billion times. 
The Brook Park Amusement Park, where the Atomium can be seen, is the favorite place of Brazilians and tourists alike. In the Canepolis Movie Multiplex, a total of 600 square meters of screens and the most advanced sound technology provides for unforgettable entertainment. And the fun can continue at the Oceade Aqua Park that has an indoor tropical park, saunas, wave pools, and slides. And where else could you expect to find a park named Mini Europe but in the capital of the European Union? Over 300 miniatures represent the most famous buildings of the countries of the EU. Landmarks of London, Paris, Berlin, Athens, Rome, and Madrid, a model of the Acropolis, the Big Ben, the Brandenburg Gate, the Colosseum, the Tower, the Notre Dame, and the Eiffel Tower can all be seen here. Of course, the famous structures of the lowlands are also featured in the lineup. The models are lit at night, and that probably makes it an even more unforgettable sight. The miniature trains, cars, and ships can move along tracks. And they can even cross under the English Channel through a see-through channel. Of course, the matador and the bull also move around in the arena. And under the Doja Palace, gondolas glide on the water. The Battle of Waterloo was a defining event for Napoleon and all Europe. That was where the world-conquering French army was defeated by the troops of the Duke of Wellington. Napoleon resigned and was exiled to the island of St. Helen afterwards. Of course, everything in the previously unknown Belgian village is all about the battle and the two opposing generals. The Butte de Lyon is a 40-meter high artificial hill raised at the place where the Duke of Orange, one of the generals of Wellington, was wounded. 226 stairs lead up to the statue of a lion on top of the hill. Cycloramas first became popular in the 19th century. The 110-meter-long panoramic painting of Louis de Molin depicting the Battle of Waterloo was finished in 1912 and was placed in a gallery specifically made to accommodate it. Three kilometers from Waterloo, there is a wax museum where the heroes of the battle come alive in the form of wax figures and paintings. Even the farm where Napoleon spent the day before the battle is dedicated to his memory. The inn where Wellington stayed the night prior to the battle was turned into a museum. The Église Saint-Joseph Chapel is right across the street. The small St. Joseph Church was originally a royal chapel. Today, it's a monument dedicated to the casualties of the battle. 
It was significantly enlarged in order to provide ample room for the memorial plaques of the fallen soldiers. The majority of these tablets were made from the donations of soldiers paying tribute to the memory of their commanders. The battle took place on the 18th of June. Each year there's an anniversary show acted out by enthusiasts of war history dressed in period costumes who reenact the events of the day. The war gaming table set up in the museum is ground for heated debates. The battle may also be replayed as a board game or a computer game. These are also available at the gift shops that are a constant feature everywhere, including Waterloo as well. The city of Antwerp, located north of Brussels, is an attractive and easily accessible destination for tourists. Antwerp is the second largest town of Belgium and the largest city of the Flemish-speaking region. It's also been the world center of diamond trade since the Middle Ages. The old town is on the left bank of the River Scheldt. That's where the largest Gothic cathedral of the country, the Our Lady, spreads out in an area of over a hectare. With a height of 123 meters, its spire rises well above the one- and two-story buildings of the old town. The construction of the cathedral began in 1352 and spanned almost two centuries. A high relief depicting the Last Judgment sits above its feature-arched entrance. The main square of the city is the Grote Markt, the Grand Marketplace. The northern side of the square is lined by guild houses, just like in Brussels. The statue of Antwerp's most famous Peter Paul Rubens also stands at the marketplace. The compelling array of buildings reflects the golden age of 16th century commerce and was built by the help of architects brought in from various countries of Europe. Attention, not all statues are what they seem. A simple camera will not do if you want to take a shot of this statue group. You need a video camera for that. There are many street musicians, mimes, marionette artists, and human statues also in the streets of Belgium in the hope of getting some change. They make the shopping streets come alive and put smiles on the faces of people strolling by. Another attraction of the main square is the town hall with its peculiar façade designed by Cornelis Floris in 1615. The statues of the building were also created by him. The walls of the town hall are decorated in part by frescoes of Brabant dukes from the 1500s and partly by a series of 19th century paintings celebrating the history of the city. The main decoration of the middle of the square is the Brabo fountain. The sculpture shows Silvius Brabo throwing the hand of a mythological giant into the river. The fountain is the best known meeting point in town. On top of the houses along the Grote Markt, gilded statues reflect the sunlight. Among the figures, St. George and the Dragon, Justitia and Prudentia can be seen. Public transport in Antwerp is just as efficient as in the capital. There's an extensive network of tram lines in the city that you can take anywhere you want to go. In cities with a historic atmosphere, quite often horse-drawn carriages evoke past eras that were devoid of cars. However, the horse trams are really unique to Antwerp. Such horse-drawn double-deckers roamed the streets of many European cities once, but the coaches that remained have long been exiled to transportation museums. But here, these renovated vehicles are an integral part of everyday public transportation. We've mentioned Belgian cuisine earlier, but the picture wouldn't be complete without Belgian beer. Belgium produces more beer than any other country in over 400 varieties. In addition to the big beer factories, about 100 home breweries are still in operation today. Stella Artois is also a Belgian brand. Among the varieties of the frothy drink, you can find wheat beer and cherry or raspberry flavored fruit beers as well. 
The old castle of Antwerp, home to the Naval Museum, looks like a real fairy tale castle. The 10th century fort was used as a prison in the Middle Ages. The gates are guarded by a statue of an ogre, while there is a rich collection on display in 12 halls inside, completed by a fleet of barges anchored at the riverbank. Transportation is exemplary in every city all over the lowlands, but the thousands of little marvels tucked away in their ancient old towns can only be discovered by walking around them. You can always stop for some good Belgian waffles at any corner, or have a portion of the thin-sliced, double-fried French fries served with mayonnaise anywhere, a perfect snack to be washed down with some Belgian beer specialty. There's an extraordinarily large number of clothes shops, posh boutiques, home design and antique stores, accompanied by numerous stationery, toy and gift shops as well. In this house on Vopper Square lived and worked Peter Paul Rubens, one of the greatest painters of his time, from 1610 until his death in 1640. Enter through the gates designed by Rubens and marvel at the gilded leather covering of the hallway, along with the small Baroque portico. The living room, dining room, and the bedroom of his home are open to visitors, but the most interesting part of the house is his studio, where he's said to have created 2,500 paintings. According to the customs of the time, the master only made a drawing of his paintings, which were subsequently painted by his apprentices. In addition to the Rubens house, there are many things to see in Antwerp. Great works of art by Bruegel, Van Eyck, and many others are on show at the Museum of Fine Arts, at the Rokox House, and in the Van de Berg Museum. And since you're in the European capital of diamonds, it would be a pity to miss the Diamond Museum. Ever since the Swedish invented the concept of the open-air museum, it's been used in many cities all over Europe as a method to preserve the architecture of times gone past. Belgium started building its open-air museum displaying pre-1900 Flemish country life in 1953 at Bokrijk, east of Brussels. In the area tucked among the forest-covered hills in the province of Limburg, over a hundred buildings have been built by now. The houses were first dismantled, each of the pieces numbered, and rebuilt at their new place in a perfect duplicate of the original settlement. The houses and the belonging home furnishings were collected from three regions, from the plains of East and West Flanders, from the highlands of Brabant, Limburg and Maasland, and from the rather barren land of Kempen. The pride possessions of the open-air museum are the various types of mills so typical to the lowlands. The mills are still in operation and fully furnished, just like the workshops and the family houses. Among the buildings, you can see a granary, stables, a coach house, dovecotes, and a beer brewery. All buildings are open to visitors and feature interiors furnished by furniture from the era. This goes for almost all of the open-air folk museums, but Bokrijk offers a uniquely special feature as well. The employees of the open-air museum walk among the visitors dressed in garments characteristic to the era. The spinners, weavers, and lace makers all wear the clothes of their great-grandmothers. At the inn, old ladies sip their tea and the vegetable gardens are weeded by peasants wearing 19th century clothes.
The local priest holds a mass at the chapel. Millers, bakers, and pottery makers are all busy doing their everyday work, and a postman is riding his bicycle along the streets. Various activities offer visitors the chance to try riding old wooden bicycles, or to fish, make pottery, grind wheat, bake bread, or ride a horse. Visitors can imagine themselves back in a more relaxed age, when rushing and stress did not exist, and the hazards of civilization were yet unknown. Here we have an opportunity to learn more not only about history, past ways of life, and period fashion, but also about the country, as well as the traditions and culture of its people. The memories of this experience will surely be taken home, not only in photographs, but also in the heart of anyone who visits. There are also many kinds of animals living around the old homes, such as cows, donkeys, dogs, chickens, and other birds. You can also take an inside look at the art of wood carving at the carpenter's shop. The new section of the open air museum features the buildings of an old hamlet. In the Middle Ages, the city of Ghent was famous for its textile industry, but the industrial boom of the 18th and 19th centuries took a toll in the 20th century. Because of environmental pollution, not only tourists started avoiding the city, but many of its inhabitants, especially young people, moved away from here as well. About 25 years ago, a program was initiated to close down the environmentally hazardous plants and rebuild them further away in a modernized fashion thereby separating the industrial area from the heart of the city. Ghent was completely reconstructed. Its beautiful medieval buildings were cleaned and renovated. Parks were built and the channels were made suitable for water traffic. It was worth it. As a result, in addition to Brussels, Antwerp, and Bruges, Ghent has also become a favorite destination for tourists. The founders of the city had a selection of three rivers to choose from. Maybe they could not decide where to settle because Ghent still does not have a real center up to this day. Boat rides offer pleasant entertainment, despite the fact that Belgium is relatively rainy. The average annual precipitation is 90 centimeters. The sunniest months are from May to August. The average annual temperature is 11 degrees Celsius. The maritime climate is characterized by mild and damp autumns and winters. The wettest months are April and November. The best time to visit is during the summer and early autumn months. The Count of Flanders built a fortress on the bank of the River Lys. The somber gates and bastions of Gravenstein still dominate the view of the old town. The castle later served as a prison and was even used as a cotton factory. The residence of the Counts and the tower are accessible through a tunnel that runs from the main gates of the castle. 
the 12th through the 14th century marked a period of rapid growth for Ghent, and as incredible as it sounds, at the time, it was the second largest city of Europe after Paris. The city started to take shape and grow around two monasteries, the fort and the saint Baths Abbey. The economic boom brought along by the shipping and textile industries attracted many rich weavers and merchants to the city. At the time, the town already had 52 guilds registered at Town Hall. The townsfolk rose up against the high and mighty potentates, but the people's uprising, led by Jakob von Artefelde, was vanquished. Soon the Burgundy era arrived in the life of Ghent. The city refused to pay the ever-increasing taxes, so the king resorted to violence. As a result, 20,000 civilians of Ghent fell in the battlefield. The latter King Charles V was born as the child of Maximilian of Habsburg and Mary of Burgundy in Ghent, but he wouldn't let even his hometown stand in the way of his ambitions for power. Since the city refused to pay the newly imposed exorbitant taxes, the emperor revoked all privileges of Ghent, had Baf's Abbey destroyed and commissioned a citadel in its place. The emperor's verdict ended the prosperity of the city. After a boom in the 18th century, Ghent is experiencing a new renaissance today. With the population of a quarter million, Ghent is the capital of East Flanders and it has an atmosphere somewhat different from Bruges and Antwerp. The most picturesque part of the city is the former corn market, the Korenmarkt, and the neighboring Krasle. There on the bank of the Ley River was the local harbor, and that is where the most beautiful guild houses were built. The stonework on the facades of the buildings look as if they were made of Brussels lace. You can view these sites from an unusual aspect if you take a boat ride around the city. The St. Michael Bridge offers a spectacular view of all three historical landmarks of the city, the St. Nicholas Church, the Bell Fort, and the Gothic spires of the St. Baths Cathedral. The square in front of the St. Nicholas Church is the Corn Market. It used to be a corn market and has been the commercial hub of the city since the Middle Ages. Today, it's lined with popular cafes. The crypt of the St. Buff's Cathedral dates back to 1150. Its steeple was built in the 15th century. The most notable attraction of the cathedral is an enigmatic altarpiece, the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb. The huge four-square watchtower of Belfort stands in front of the former cloth and market hall. Today, the observation deck at the top of the tower is also accessible by an elevator. Photographers shouldn't pass up this chance. The replaced old bell of the guards can now be seen on the square in front of the Belfort. The Belgians call Ostende the Queen of the Seas. First 150 years ago during the reign of King Leopold I, then later under Leopold II, it was one of the most popular holiday resorts in Europe. It was a meeting place of kings, dignitaries, artists, diplomats, and wealthy members of the upper class. The world-famous Kurzal was also built at that time and enjoyed great popularity among the high society up until World War II. Today, a huge casino stands in its place with a concert hall of 2,500 seats. The Art Deco building of the Palais de Terme Spa Hotel is a more historic structure. The town pier and the restored summer residence of the king are worth a visit, too. The modern apartment blocks provide a completely natural backdrop to the boardwalk. There are many cafes, beachwear, sportswear, and gift shops on the street front, bottom floor of the buildings, just like in any cosmopolitan resort in the world. Music 
As a stark contrast to this, the white clapboard changing cubicles create a nostalgic mood. Bruges is undoubtedly a heaven for tourists. The only way to describe the feeling evoked by Bruges is that time really stands still there. It's almost as if the whole city were a single huge museum or historic set piece. Even apart from its ancient monuments, it has aesthetic significance. One of the most beautiful and best preserved medieval towns of Europe. Today we might find it lucky that the river Zvin silted up so badly in the 15th century that it became unfit for water transport. Thus, the city was not industrialized in subsequent centuries either, so it could keep its medieval buildings. The town also survived the two world wars without any substantial damage. There are no ill-fitting modern high-rises or even street furniture, street lights, or billboards here. The St. Salvatore's Holy Savior Cathedral is the oldest brick church in Belgium. There was a chapel on this site as early as the 7th century. The construction of the church lasted from the 12th until the 16th century, and then it was modified in the 19th century. It has a peculiar 99-meter-high Romanesque tower with little spires and shot towers. For everyone who visits Bruges, the Arendshaus Lace Museum is a must-see place, housed in an 18th century building overlooking the river. The Groningen Museum of Fine Arts features a fabulous collection of works from the greatest painters of the lowlands. The Groothuizen Museum offers a rich display of medieval objects and interiors in its 22 maze-like wooden beamed halls. The construction of the red brick Church of Our Lady spanned 200 years so it's no wonder that it's characterized by a mix of architectural styles. The unadorned interior with the snow-white walls and pillars is reminiscent of the early medieval times, but its side chapels and pulpits are embellished in the over-decorated style of the Baroque era. At the turn of the 20th century, during a renovation, efforts were made to restore the medieval style of the building. Its church spire reaches up to 122 meters, only one meter lower than that of the Antwerp Cathedral. The most valuable artifact of the church is a sculpture, the Madonna and Child by Michelangelo. That's the master's only creation that ever left Italy in his lifetime. It was bought by two wealthy Flemish merchants, Jan and Alexander Mascroon, and donated as a gift to their hometown. The fresco of King St. Louis is a worthy sight. The church is also home to the mausoleum of Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, and his daughter Mary, who died in a horse accident. The graves are guarded by a beautiful triptych of Baron von Orly. In the stone exhibit under the arcades of the parochial buildings surrounding the church, high reliefs and column fragments are on display. A monastery and a seminary are hidden in the maze-like red brick side wings. Bruges is surrounded by an oval-shaped open ditch that follows the line of the former city walls. You can tour the city by boat or walking along the canals, just like in Venice. In the Benelux countries, Bruges is considered the rightful holder of the name Venice of the North. A glimpse at the medieval houses reflected in the water of the river Diver justifies this belief. The canals were carved out by the sea that often flooded the entire town as well. The first mention of the settlement dates back to the 7th century. In order to protect the town from the attacks of the Norsemen from the sea, a fortress was built. Seamen, merchants, craftsmen, peasants, cattle breeders, and fishermen brought their goods to the walls of the castle. Then, as more and more people settled down in the area, the town gradually formed around the castle. 
the natural canals were regulated, and the surrounding areas were developed. Everything the land of Flanders offered could be transported quickly and cheaply by water. That way, their goods reached England, France, and Germany. The Genoese, Venetian, and Spanish ships brought people, goods, and ideas from abroad. The textile industry and architecture flourished, since the rich merchants commissioned gorgeous palaces and public buildings. Of course, there were poor people at that time as well. They lived in the long, low, whitewashed houses of the Rollweg. The best folk museum in Flanders is housed in these buildings with an exhibit on life in the 17th century. Traditional house interiors, furniture, fixtures, and personal articles are on display here, and in the workshops you can see craftsmen working with period tools, including a tanner, a smith, a potter, a weaver, and a carpenter. The King of France had his eye on the city and attempted to conquer it several times. In 1302, the French cavalry charged to overtake it, but suffered a crushing defeat. Decades went by before they got a chance to take revenge. In the 15th century, the city started to decline due to a bad business decision. In order to protect its own industries, Bruges banned the import of English wool and cloth. However, the city's eternal rival Antwerp did not. To make things worse, the river Zwin silted up and became unnavigable, thereby making the port inaccessible to the merchant ships. Although the city council issued a decree on the construction of a new canal, it was never realized. The center of Hanseatic trade and thus most of the merchants moved from Bruges to Antwerp. The city became depopulated and sank into a several century long Cinderella sleep. The construction of the 10-kilometer-long and 70-meter-wide canal was carried out only four centuries later to reconnect the city with the sea and, through it, with the world. In the last half of the 19th century, Bruges became the tourist destination as we know it today. A multitude of visitors curious to see the Waterloo battlefield stopped by in Bruges on the way and were greatly impressed by the beauty of this intact medieval city. Among the visitors was Sir Walter Scott, the famous Scottish author of historical novels, who picked up a few of the weapons left behind on the battlefield with his own hands to display the collection in the Knights Hall in his own home. He spoke highly of Bruges as he found the historical milieu of the city truly fascinating. Anyone who's once taken a walk or a sightseeing tour around Bruges by boat or carriage is probably of the same opinion. The quaint charm of the medieval houses is almost non-existent in Europe anymore. Here we can discover a completely different world, the world of our grandfathers and great-grandfathers. It's well worth disconnecting from the 21st century for a moment to stop and smell the fresh air of medieval times. The Bourg is a pleasant cobbled square that used to be the civic and religious center of Bruges. The old fortified castle around which the city was built also stood here. The spired facade of Town Hall was completed in 1375. The square holds an array of the most beautiful buildings of the city. 
The Flemish and Wallon flags, along with the national crest of Belgium on the top of the town hall, as with any other public building in the country, indicate that Belgium was built and is inhabited by two equal nations. Next to Town Hall and tucked in the southwest corner of the Bourg is the Basilica of the Holy Blood. It was named after its most treasured relic, a few drops of Christ's blood brought here by Thierry, Count of Flanders after the Second Crusade, between 1150 and 1200. The Town Hall has been serving in this function since 1375. It's also home to the Mayor's Office and the Wedding Hall. The foyer and the Gothic Conference Rooms are open to visitors all year. The ceiling is adorned by splendid wood carving, while the walls feature a series of paintings depicting the city's history. The modern statues on the facade were created in the 60s to replace the original ones that were destroyed by the French army. The statue in the middle of the Markt is a monument erected to Jan Breidel and Peter de Koning who led the 1302 uprising against the French and died a heroic death in the battle. With one exception, all the buildings of the Markt, or Main Square, were built in the 17th century. The oldest building is the House Bouchot, where King Charles II also lived during his exile in 1656 and 57. On the east side of the Markt stands the Provincial Hof that served as a warehouse for the goods brought to town by the ships. The office of the Governor of West Flanders was also located in this neo-Gothic complex. To the right, the sprawling building of the post office is grand enough to qualify as a palace. The 83-meter-high belfry towering over the square is the Belfort. It's the most famous landmark of the city and of course, it also operates as an observatory. The charter defining the city's rights and privileges, including its right to free trade, were kept here. Now they're safeguarded at the town hall. In the village of Dame, located five kilometers from Bruges, is the alleged grave site of the legendary folktale hero Till Eulenspiegel although it's not known whether he was actually a real person or only the creature of Charles Coster's fantasy. Belgium has a special heritage that has almost died out in today's Europe, and that is our own medieval history.